Welcome and hello. I will present today seismic geomechanics, the process of building and calibrating geomechanical models using 3D and 4D seismic data. Today I will speak to you in three parts about building and calibrating geomechanical models. In the first part I will show the three main uses that seismic data provide in building geomechanical models. The first use is the traditional use of seismic data in terms of horizon and fault interpretations for building structural models. However, there's more information in seismic data. We also want to use AVO inversion in rock physics models for property model building of geomechanical models. Lastly, seismic data can be used for model calibration. I will elaborate all three points in two case studies. The first case study is a 3D exploration geomechanical model and I'll present the workflow. Before I do that, I will show how borehole image data are needed to validate predicted stress directions. I will then go through the workflow of building 3D, 3D geomechanical models. After that, I'll continue by showing the influence of faults and stress directions and magnitude. And finally, I'll show how predicted stress directions and magnitudes can be used for ident identification of sa safe drilling trajectories and safe drilling mud weights. In my second case study, uh, finishing the presentation, I will present a 4D geomechanical model used for field development planning. Again, I will be using 3D seismic data and AVO inversion in support of property modeling. And I will then show how 4D seismic data may be used for geomechanical model validation. I'll show how the geomechanical model can then be applied to understand hydraulic stimulation operations. Let's start. <laughs> what are the components of a geomechanical or mechanical earth model? Independent of building, whether you are building a geomechanical model in 1D or 3D, you will always have the same components. So you can see in the top of the slide, there's two parts. There are the elastic and strength properties, and there are the earth stresses and pore pressure. This is very similar to a mechanical model used in civil engineering. Say if you uh, plan and design a bridge, you need to understand the elastic and strength properties of the material, in that case steel, to be used. And you need to understand the loads, that is forces and stresses that act upon this structure, the bridge. If you have a strong material, you need a larger stress to fail the bridge. In the same way, if you have a strong earth material, you will have to have larger stresses to, to fail the material. Now, in seismic geomechanics, we try to get the elastic and strength properties from seismic data as much as we can. As you see in this slide, on the right side, you have uh, the same information as in the previous slide, where we have the elastic and strength properties and the earth stresses and pore pressure. There's two additional columns on the left labeled geology. I'm now showing a structural framework model. The second column labeled mechanical stratigraphy indicates a collection of earth materials that will have a similar mechanical behavior. Here, the primary distinction would typically be between uh, grain and clay supported rock types or lithologies. Um, here I would indicate them by yellow and brown colors. Blue could typically show carbonate rocks and the purple color may indicate a salt lithology. The reason why we group together materials of similar mechanical uh, properties is such that we can assign plastic behaviors according to earth materials. For example, salts will creep, so we will want to assign a lithology to all um, salt rocks. At the bottom of the slide, I'm indicating how seismic data can be used in deriving each four of these uh, main components of a mechanical earth model. Starting on the left, for the structural framework model, as you all know, we will be using horizon and faults from seismic interpretation. 
the mechanical strate stratigraphy as well as elastic and strength properties uh, can be derived using VP and VS velocities from seismic AVO inversion. The mechanical st stratigraphy can be derived by seismic lithology prediction and, and whereby the mechanical properties are then calculated using correlation functions with the AVO inversion derived VP and VS velocities. Finally, pore pressure as an input to a mechanical earth model may be derived from a seismic interval velocities or tomographically derived velocities using a suitable calibration process or basin modeling. Stress and strain cannot be directly derived from seismic data, but here I will argue that they are derived by finite element analysis in the same way that the mechanical integrity of a bridge, which I used as an example earlier, can be derived by finite element analysis of the stresses and strains within the structure. After introducing the elements of a geomechanical model, I now want to show how we can build geomechanical models in practice. Now I'll start by showing a 3D exploration geomechanical workflow. Before getting into details of building the geomechanical model, I did want to show tensile failure and borehole breakouts in a valuable wall. And I will arrive at the same slide at the end of, of the seismic geomechanics workflow. What you can see on the left side of the slide is a finite element model, near valuable model of a vertical well. The dark black circle in the center represents the well bore with a diameter of 20 centimeters and color coded around it are computed stresses. See, I'm color coding here the intermediate principal stress. As you can see in a direction aligned north, east, southwest, you have uh, some red anomalies indicating a low intermediate principal stress. Now, if we analyze the entire stress tensor in the near well bore, I'm showing the upper quarter of the same image, and now I'm showing two horizontal stresses. What we can see is that in the far field that is far away from the well bore, the stresses align with sigma h max and sigma h min in the far field. Those are the forces acting inside the Earth. Sometimes they're called the regional tectonic stress field. A vertical well bore is essentially a vertical tunnel that is filled with drilling fluid, which pushes against the well bore wall. Between the far field stresses and the free surface boundary at the well bore wall, a, uh, the, the stress field is locally perturbed, and that's what is calculated here. Now, if we analyze the image in some more detail, we can see that the minimum principal stress, that would be the shortest arrow of, between the two arrows that you can see, uh, becomes uh, uh, zero. The length of this arrow becomes zero, which means that the minimum principal stress goes into tension and a tensile force develops inside um, the rock. This can result in tensile failure if this tensile stress exceeds the tensile strength of the rock and an induced fracture is being generated. At 90 degrees of the tensile failure, what you can see is a large difference between the two horizontal stresses. We call this a large deviatoric stress. This can result in shear failure and typically um, when shear failure in the valve wall occurs, we may get warhole breakouts. Let us see how th uh, this can be observed using warhole images. On the left side, we have a set of two warhole images. Um, the vertical axis would represent depth, and along the horizontal axis in each um, image, you look around the azimuth of the entire well bore, starting from north, going over east to the south, west and back to north. 
The left image is an ultrasonic borehole image or UBI image. The right image is an electric scanning image or form formation microimager image. And what you can see, what becomes immediately obvious, is a dark band at around east and west direction and a thin fracture in, about in a north and a south direction. And I'm indicating that in the schematic sketch. Now the white band are borehole breakouts and the narrow band are induced fractures. The dark colors are caused by low reflection amplitudes in the UBI images and a loss of focus in the FMI image. As we saw from the stress modeling in the previous slide, the direction of the induced fracture will indicate the azimuth of the maximum horizontal stress and the direction of the borehole breakouts indicates the azimuth of the minimum horizontal stress. In the next couple of slides, I will go through, a set, through an exploration workflow at the end of which I will arrive again at the same wellbore images. The traditional model of uh, geophysical contracting companies was to acquire data. I'm showing on the left seismic data and borehole data. And then what would be delivered to the client is seismic data or log curves. Now, of course, all the, data, all the information is somehow contained in the data but it is not unlocked. So obviously, the data needs to be used for useful purposes such as prospect identification, well trajectory planning, or deciding on a safe drilling mud, mud weight. Now I talked about this to my parents and they told me, well, this is kind of obvious. Are you really paid a lot of money to Tell, tell me something that's perfectly obvious. The answer is the following. In my job, I'm being paid to fill all the boxes in the workflow. What you can see is there's many processes involved. We start on the left from seismic data processing, which is a specialized discipline within the ENP workflow. Petrophysical evaluation, a different job group again. Geophysical interpretation of faults and horizons. And in your own time, you can read all the other boxes. Right? The important bit here is it's a long and complicated workflow. Wherever you see an arrow, data or models are handed off between one discipline to the next. And just as a word of warning, whenever data or models are handed over, there's a great opportunity to make mistakes. And believe me, I've made them all. Next couple of slides, I want to take you through this workflow and show how uh, colleagues of mine and myself have executed this workflow on exploration data set uh, from Northwest Australia. Along this profile, you see 30 kilometers worth of seismic data. What I do want to point out is in this data set, there are uh, clearly visible horizons and faults. Maybe you can spot a flat spot in a tilted fault block, as I'm indicating by the callout, which is one of the primary targets and exploration targets in the area. I'm also indicating draped sediments, which form a secondary target. Now, as part of a seismic geomechanics workflow, I want to point out that seismic data this form is used for structural model building in the form of interpretations of horizons and faults. Due to the high quality of the data set, we derived a high quality AVO inversion product, which we then used for property population of the geomechanical model. What I'm showing in this slide is an acoustic impedance cube from the same, same 30 uh, line, inline kilometers and I do want to point out a slight difference to a traditional AVO inversion workflow which is centered on the reservoir. Here 
we performed the AVR inversion from the sea bottom um, to the full length of the seismic data here, six, six uh, seconds. From the acoustic impedance and Poisson's ratios out of the inversion cubes, um, the horizons and the faults from the structural interpretation, we built a geocellular model, converted it to depth, applied stress boundary conditions, and calculated the 3D stress field for the entire model. Based on the structural model built from interpreted horizons and faults, and the property model derived from seismic AV AVO inversions for acoustic impedance and Poisson's ratio, combined with tectonic stress field boundary conditions, a 3D stress field cube is calculated. What I am showing in this slide, in the horizon horizontal layer, are stress tensors within one layer of the model. The stress tensor gives the forces in different directions for, for one uh, layer. So you can see in, by the color coding of the arrows um, that the vertical stress would typically be larger in this area than the two horizontal stresses. In a vertical slice in the background, I'm plotting a deviatoric stress. Again, that is a measure for the differences between the three principal stresses, where high deviatoric stresses will cause likely shear failure inside the rock. As you can see, at the location of faults, we have concentrations of high deviatoric stresses, which is not surprising because, after all, the rock failed in shear to form the fault. What I did want to talk to you about is the influence of the faults on the stress direction. So sometimes in geology classes I heard sentences like the regional stress direction. Now I would dare you to find out the regional stress direction in this image. What I am showing by the small arrows is the direction of the intermediate principal stress here, that's also the maximum horizontal stress, indicating what we generally refer to as the stress direction. Now, is it north-south, as in the center of the image, or is it northeast, southwest, as in the left part of the image? You can clearly see along the fault, which I indicated as fault one, that there is a sudden flip of the stress direction. So what I would argue is, there is no such thing as a regional stress direction, but only a local stress direction. Now, since this is a computational model, I can tell you what boundary stresses are used, which again, one could argue is the regional stress direction. And that is in a direction pretty much aligned with northeast, southwest, from the top right to the bottom left of that image. Let us now investigate how the changes in stress direction across the fault would influence uh, borehole image logs. So through the 3D geomechanical model, I dropped two vertical wellbore trajectories. On the computer, simulated the excavation of the rock during the drilling um, operation and recomputed the stress field in a near wellbore um, of these two horizontal wells. The left of the two horizontal wells you will have seen in the initial slides of this section. And we can go back to the initial picture. We can now understand from the 3D geomechanical model to the 1D near wellboard geomechanical model why tensile failure would occur in the direction of the sigma H max in the far field and why shear failure may occur in the near wellbore wall in the direction of sigma small h in the far field. Now, this was academically interesting. Now, of much more practical importance is to define a safe mud weight window and a safe drilling di direct. Uh, of more practical importance is the derivation 
of a safe mud weight window and a safe drilling direction. If the mud weight is too low, well bore breakouts will occur and the well bore may collapse causing stuck pipe or due to high pore pressure I may take a kick. Both effects are undesirable and outright dangerous. If the mud weight is too high, as we have seen, we can cause induced fractures at the well bore wall. If the pressure exerted by the drilling mud, the drilling fluid can propagate into an induced fracture, again with the loss of drilling mud. We can then define a mud weight window as the allowable range of mud weights for giving drilling di directions such that none of the four effects above occur. What I'm showing on the image on the left are in color coded in purple are geo bodies of narrow mud weight window. The light shade of purple is a narrow mud weight window, and the dark shade of purple is a closed mud weight window. So we can see that on the left side of the fold it is much more difficult to drill than on the right side of the fold. So if I have a choice where to place the well in an exploration setting, I would not want to place the well, the, the well on the left side of the fold but I know that I will have problems drilling the well. So what I have shown in a 3D exploration to mechanical workflow was how to take seismic data from acquisition through processing inversion to building a geomechanical model and identification of safe drilling uh, trajectories and mud weights. Once we move into an exploitation phase of fields, geomechanical models can have further uses. Right? We typically have also more seismic data available, it is better calibrated, more well logs become available and with some luck we also will have access to time-lapse seismic data on a field. To show what we can do with a wealth of data, I wanted to share with you today a 4D geomechanical model used for field development planning. Again, I will show how we use seismic AVO inversion, especially again acoustic impedance as a porosity indicator, how porosity is linked to the rock strength for this field, which allows confident building of a geomechanical property model. We, in this field, we also have access to time-lapse seismic data. It is a compacting field in the Danish sector of the North Sea. The rest of our compaction causes overburden time-lapse time shifts and we will use this as a compaction indicator. And in turn, can use the observed compact compaction as a validation for the geomechanical model. Once we have a validated or calibrated geomechanical model, I wanted to show how we can apply this geomechanical model to understand the stimulation pattern, especially the azimuth of growth of induced fractures. Again, the time-lapse seismic data has a second use. We can validate the predicted direction of fracture growth by observing time-lapse seismic anomalies and comparing them to the direction of predicted fracture, fracture growth. The 3D seismic AVO inversion data, which you can see on the left, can be used as a porosity indicator. What you, what you see on the left is uh, the inverted seismic data for acoustic impedance and Poisson's ratio. In the acoustic impedance image, the purple colors indicate a low acoustic impedance that is either a, a slow p-wave velocity or slow bulk density. I also indicated the top and a reservoir, base reservoir and an intra-reservoir horizon by the black lines. As you can see in the center of the image there is a purple zone indicating a low acoustic impedance. Now if you look at a chalk rock physics model, the reservoir lithology is a, is a chalk, we can see from cross plots of a Poisson's ratio versus acoustic impedance while color coding uh, porosity that the low porosities, 10% would be the blue dots, 
resulting in high acoustic impedances, whereas the high porosities, up to 40% in this field, resulting in low acoustic impedances. So we can see that the purple area within the reservoir would probably be the best reservoir quality, um, characterized by very high porosity. Applying the rock physics model to the uh, AVO inversion models, we can derive volumes of porosity over the entire field. What you can see in this slide is a high porosity geobody extracted from the seismic AVO inversions. And we will see that this high porosity geobody is mainly responsible for reservoir compaction observed in the field. Let me motivate why. In this slide, I'm presenting a chalk compaction model. Each one of the horizontal lines in green rep represents a sample of rock of high porosity at the top, 45%, the decrease of 5% porosity from line to line. It's 45, 40, 35, 30, 25, and 20% 20 porosity chalk. As the reservoir pore pressure is reduced, the sample of rock moves along the line from left to right. A reduction in pore pressure causes an increase in mean effective stress. Once the mean effective stress reaches a certain threshold, which I call a critical pressure, the rock starts to fail. And you can see that a further decrease in pore pressure causes a rapid decrease in porosity. The rock compacts. What we, can derive, what we can see in this slide is that high porosity chalk, the top lines, has a low critical pressure, so it will fail at a low mean effective stress. We can also see that water bearing chalk has a lower critical pressure at which it fails than oil saturated chalk. Putting that, this information together with the porosity model, combining it uh, in a geomechanical model, and forward modeling the seismic effects, we can see um, that where the reservoir compacts, we will see overburden time-lapse time shifts. These were observed at this field. On the left, you see a seismic um, survey from 1995. Production startup is in 1999 for this field, and the monitor survey was acquired in 2005. The two images on the surface of it look very similar, as they should. However, in detail, there's minute differences, which are the time-lapse seismic signal. I'm extracting a single seismic trace along a key well location, in green for the base survey and blue for the monitor survey. And if we zoom in on the reservoir region, we can see that there are small changes in time-lapse amplitude, the traditional time-lapse seismic attribute used for evaluation, and a small time-lapse time shift. Let me motivate where this time-lapse time shift originates from using a reservoir geomechanical model. Reservoir simulation gives us the predicted change in oil saturation and pore pressure. The decrease in pore pressure will cause an increase in effective stress inside the reservoir, which causes the reservoir compaction. As the reservoir compacts, the overburden will stretch causing a decrease in effective stress. That is the blue, blue cloud above and below the reservoir in the uh, center image. The increase in effective stress is, the red, is indicated by the red colors inside the reservoir. As the stress field, the vertical stress increases inside the reservoir, the reservoir compacts and each cell um, uh, moves towards a smaller thickness. The overburden stretches and each cell in the geocellular model uh, stretches in a vertical direction. Simulating um, seismic data, seismic travel time data from that model, for the base survey and monitor survey, we can see that overburdened time-lapse time, time shifts are caused by the effect of a slowdown in velocity in the overburden caused by the overburden stretching. And due to the um, change in length and travel path, due to the overburden stretching, 
we cause an additional increase in, in seismic time-lapse time shifts. And that's what I'm simulating in the bottom right image. Now we can um, do this analysis on field seismic data. And I, again, I want to draw your attention to the high porosity geobody that I'm displaying here. It is corroborated by an increase in water saturation derived from 4D AVO inversion. And that same anomaly is now visible in overburdened time-lapse time shifts um, at the top reservoir reflector, which I'm showing in this slide. The area of the largest observed compaction outlined in the by the purple line coincides with the region of high porosity determined from, from 3D seismic o in AVO inversion. Now, I can use these seismic time-lapse time shifts as a measure for reservoir compaction and compare them with a predicted reservoir subsidence from a geomechanical model. And whereas the two models appear superficially very similar, there's um, large differences in detail. Outlined in red are all the areas where no compaction is observed, as you can see on the left but sizable amounts of compaction is predicted by the geomechanical model. Vice versa, in the areas outlined in yellow, large amounts of compaction are observed, but which are not predicted by the geomechanical model. Now, since building the first geomechanical model in, in the year 2005, the 3D AVO inversion has become available. More data is, uh, uh, more studies have been done on the reservoir, resulting in an update of the porosity model and from rock mechanical testing data, a better chalk compaction model was derived. With that information, a new geomechanical model was built in the year 2012. I'm showing now the results of predicted compaction from the 2012 geomechanical model and the time-lapse seismic data. And as you can see, the new geomechanical model better predicts the observed compaction. So we use the time-lapse seismic data to validate the geomechanical model. Having a validated geomechanical model builds trust in predictions from the geomechanical model. Having a geomechanical model in which we can trust allows with confidence predictions of uh, hydraulic uh, stimulation operations. Hydraulic stimulation for water flooding is slightly different, possibly, than what we have seen very popularly recently in unconventional place. In unconventional resource place, often hydraulic stim the, the well is being drilled in the direction of the minimum principal stress. Induced fractures will grow against the direction of the minimum principal stress. This is what I'm showing in the picture on the left. In water flooding um, operations, Often operators choose to drill the horizontal wells for water flooding and production in, in a direction parallel to the maximum horizontal stress. Induced fractures then grow along the wellbore axis. Uh, when water is injected into these fractures, a vertical waterfront is created that drives oil from an injector well towards a producer well. With this background information in mind, let us investigate the predicted direction of fracture growth for the case study that I'm presenting. In this image, I'm showing two key wells, producer indicated in red and an injector well indicated in blue. They're separated by about 300 meters and the, lit the small arrows indicate the direction and magnitude of the intermediate principal stress. At the time of stimulation of the horizontal producer well, all hydraulic fractures would grow along the direction of the wellbore wall as intended. After eight months of production, when the injector well was drilled, the stress field had changed in direction and magnitude and induced fractures will grow 
along the directions indicated by the small white arrows um, that just appeared on the screen. Now, injecting into these hydraulic fractures um, may result in a shortcut of the injected water towards the producer well. And we may now wonder whether our predictions are accurate. And I believe that in this case, we can use time-lapse seismic data to validate the predicted uh, fracture direction. What I'm showing here is a difference map of the of amplitudes between base and monitor survey. And if I indicate some of the small scale features that can be observed, we can now see that what we see from the time-lapse seismic amplitude changes, the small scale features align very well with the directions of the predicted induced fractures. We can also see that in the, in the center of the well, where we have the um, fractures growing in the direction perpendicular to the wellbore axis, we have the waterfront approaching the, the producer well. Which brings me to the end of my presentation today. Seismic geomechanics, which is the building and calibration of geomechanical models using seismic data. What I have talked to you about today is how we use seismic data in the form of horizon and interpret interpreted faults for building of structural models. I've used seismic data in the form of AVO inversion and rock physics models for property model building. And finally, I showed how seismic data may be used for model calibration. I applied these principles to two case studies. Of course, these are only two case studies out of a multitude of possible workflows, all related to seismic geomechanics. What I've shown today was first a 3D exploration geomechanical workflow showing how the location of faults influences stress direction magnitude, how that may cause rotations in breakouts and induced fractures in borehole images. I've shown a second case study where I used a 4D geomechanical model applied for field development planning Again, I showed the use of 3D seismic data and AVO inversion in support of property modeling. 4D seismic data in the form of time-lapse seismic time shifts for geomechanical model validation. And using the validated and calibrated geomechanical model, I showed how a geomechanical model can be used for an improved understanding of hydraulic um, stimulation operations. I hope that this presentation has stimulated some ideas. I'm looking forward to speaking to you in person.